Hello and welcome to Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today we visit with the author, Vanessa Riley. Enjoy. I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Murder in Drury Lane is the second book in the Lady Worthing Mystery Series by Vanessa Riley. It is released today, October 24th, and it is put out by Kensington. Pressed into a union of convenience, Lady Abigail Worthing knew better than to expect love. Her marriage to an absent lord does at least provide some comforts, including a box at the Drury Lane Theatre, owned by the playwright Richard Brinsley Sheridan. Abigail has always found respite at the theatre, away from the taunts, the judgmental stares, and the risks of her own secret work to help the cause of abolition, and her fears that someone from her past wants her permanently silenced. But on one particular June evening, everything collides, and the performance takes an unwelcome turn. On stage, a woman emits a scream of genuine terror. A man has been found dead in the prop room. Stabbed through the heart. Abigail's neighbor, Stapleton Henderson, is also in attendance, and the two rush backstage. The magistrate, keen to avoid bringing more attention to the case and making Lady Worthing more of a target, asks Abigail not to investigate but she cannot resist, especially when the usually curmudgeonly Henderson offers his assistance. Abigail soon discovers a tangled drama that rivals anything brought to the stage, involving gambling debts, a beautiful actress with a parade of suitors, and the very future of the Drury Lane Theatre. For Abigail, the case is complicated still further, for one suspect is a leading advocate for the cause dearest to her heart, the abolition of slavery within the British Empire. Uncovering the truth always comes at a price, but this time it may be far higher than she wishes to pay. We are very pleased to welcome to the program Vanessa Riley. She is the author of Island Queen and that series. We are going to talk to her about her new book, which comes out today, Murder in Drury Lane. It is the second in the Lady Worthing series. Welcome, Vanessa. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for having me on. Oh, we're thrilled. This is a very good series. As I said before, it's a historical, which is one of my favorites. Our listeners know how much I love historicals. But Most of our listeners love historicals. Yes, <laughs> but it's not one that becomes a history textbook. It gives you the story, adds some historical facts in there enough to make you go look it up. But it's mainly a mystery. And <laughs> that's what I like. 
What drew you to write in the Regency period in England, of all places? I am a bit of an Anglophile and a bit of an Austenite. My mother, she was the literature woman, so she was always making sure that we read Shakespeare and Thoreau and Baldwin. Good mom. <laughs> Very good mom. And one day we have this owner's assignment to read, you know, Pride and Prejudice. And I was like, ooh, this is funny. This is witty. This is talking about the different class structures, which you, you know, you don't see a lot, particularly from a woman's point of view, written in that way or that structure. And then, you know, I read the very last of her books, which she unfortunately didn't finish, was Sanditon, which mm. the wealthiest woman in the book oh, is that's a right. woman from yes. the West Indies. And I was like, my people. <laughs> was there a lot of interracial marriage during the Regency period? Was that something? There are, there are many notable ones, but the records are very interesting because you see it particularly Victorian age. It's a lot of cleanup on aisle nine where ah. certain members of families aren't discussed or their pictures are missing and things like that. <laughs> what was very common knowledge was that education was the way to improve yourself. People who had biracial, mixed race daughters, or even free blacks who became wealthy in the West Indies, they would send their kids to school in Scotland and Ireland and England. And they, like typical mothers during that time frame, wanted their children to marry well. The benefit, if one could look at it that way, if your father was a Grand Blanc in the French colonies or your father owned plantations, he had sizable dowries that he could give. And money trumps race in every aspect. I that guess I found. it does. Well, I liked that Abigail or Lady Worthing. She is an abolitionist. Mm -hmm. And she's working for the abolition of slavery in the UK. That was a thing that was going on during the Regency period. England takes the forefront. You know, you've got the founders of the movement, William Wilberforce, Thomas Clarkson, Elijah Macaulay. And then there's the mothers that we don't really hear that much about, like Hannah Moore, who actually, she's like a shero. She I sued. think she needs her own book. She needs oh, yeah. <laughs> Any woman who will sue her suitor for and then win and win enough money so that she can be single for the rest of her life. Yep. Have an estate. I mean, more props, mommy. Yes, I can. <laughs> yeah. Even though this book takes place in the past, it's dealing with a lot of issues that we still deal with today. I mean, how do you approach research on a book like this? I'm a research nut. So I am the girl who will translate French to find these little hidden vignettes. I live now in the, the British newspaper archives have go back to this, you know, well into the 1700s. They have papers from the colony. So there's a lot of West Indian papers and you find some of the most strangest, bizarre things that there needs to be a story about it. And the fight for abolition is insane. The world was on this path but it's a money issue more so than anything else. Oh, yes. Yes. You know, many of us fell in love with the Dukes from, you know, that Georgia Hare writes and these sorts of things. But the little fact that most of this money is coming from the West Indies because of family owned plantations, et cetera, the backs of enslavement, you know, tea, cotton, indigo. Sugar. Kind of glossed Sugar. Over in a lot of places. Right? <laughs> um, and it's, it's a money fight. When envisioning this, this series, I was like, well, what if you had a mixed race woman? She has both Scottish and Jamaican heritage. Her, her mother was Jamaican, her father Scottish. Incidentally, both populations have second sight. So, wow. you know, that feeling, so I, have, I have a bunch of Scottish friends. One woman in particular, she knew the house she was going to buy because she dreamed about it. Like two ah. years beforehand. And so when the real estate agent was taking her, she walked in, she's like, this is the house. She just because she dreamed it. So. But this is populations. Scots and Jamaicans both have this. So I was like, let's there's so many ways that you when you do research that the, the cultures are really very, very similar, or they have these art overarching tires. I was like, let's let's draw that into the to the story. But the fight for abolition, even though technically enslavement ends in, in London because of 
Lord Mansfield's rulings, it's still all over the rest of the world. Sure. And when the Haitian Revolution happens, the whole world is kind of, we were, you know, unfortunately, we were good with y'all being free, but now y'all want to win stuff? <laughs> I don't know about that. And it yeah. literally, you really want to be free? <laughs> you want to live in your own place? My goodness. And so mm -hmm. to me, when I read these accounts, they blew my mind. And I was like, well, what if you were a woman of privilege and you thought the world was going right and all of a sudden it stops? Wouldn't you want to get the movement going again? Wouldn't you want to do everything that you can possibly have? That's some of Lady Worthing's background. She wants to get this movement started. She wants the world to be right. She's one of those with, with the glasses, cups are half full and rainbow glasses, and she wants the world to be a certain way. Fortunately, there's reality. What's happening in politics, uh, the politics of abolition, as well as, you know, just regular tomfoolery happening in London that's ending up getting people killed. So, oh. <laughs> Her relationship with Stapleton, wouldn't that be frowned on because she is a married woman and he's the doctor and he's a neighbor and i mean they're just friends they're, they're friends right but, but there, there's hints at possibly there could be more you're gonna you know, kill off james monroe james <laughs> which is kind of like another joke because i you know i put a little extra jokes in there so yeah it <laughs> yep. well i was gonna staple 10 that's Sherlock Holmes. Hamilton is, uh, first of all, I love writing about veterans, particularly war heroes, because that's another thing that's not really talked about. Oh, yeah, Britain definitely. Was in so many wars. The Seven Years, you know, wars, the Hundred Years Wars, the, the wars with the Americans, the, the wars, you know, over the different colonies. There are a lot of men coming back broken and hurt. It impacts their families. Stapleton is a man that I imagine he was standing next to Lord Nelson right before Lord Nelson gets killed. Lord Nelson during this, 1806 is like the magic year. Yeah, oh yeah. He was... he, he's killed in 1805, but his, he has a state funeral in 1806 in January. Didn't they put him in a pickle barrel? Yes, they did. Yeah. Uh, to preserve his body. So, you know. Yeah. He... That always tickled me. The war hero put him in the pickle barrel. They didn't have it, you know, like they were out to sea. There was not much else you can do. What are you going to do? You know, they bring him back to London in 1806 and they have, I mean, a state weeping and everybody. What if you're the guy that was standing next to him and knowing that four inches separates you yeah. from living and the world losing this magnificent hero? Yeah, I, I always find it interesting in historicals when the men are coming home from war and the PTSD is raging and how they dealt with it back then what they call it shell shock or something like that it's just fascinating actually if you ask me these men barely get the help they need now i can't even imagine what they went through back then so he's an interesting character men of a certain class the upper class they had, mistresses were a common thing wives looked the other way She's basically higher than he is. In some regards, right? Yeah. So what you do is you call the lens that you're look looking yeah, at. Yeah, that's true. Abigail's a manager of convenience. Her husband is always gone. Yeah. And it's as the books fine. go on, you'll <laughs> learn more about that relationship and, and what that's going to look like. Maybe he's going to move over four inches and be... <laughs> Now, Vanessa, you talk about future books. Does this uh, book, does this series have a limited amount or are you just going to go and keep going? <laughs> I'm going to go and keep going. I would love. Oh, ah, good. I would love 30 books in this world because the, every, I wrote, all the characters to me are really interesting because they're. You, you know, have a lot to expand upon. A lot to expand upon. Yes. And each person is slightly rooted from things that I've learned, like uh, her godfather, Vaughn. The Prince Regent was rumored to have a man who took care of things for him. He was a fixer. He was a fixer. He was the Michael day. Cohen of the. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's Godfather Vaughn, right? So uh -huh. he's a fixer. And so when things happen, you know, he's either in the middle of it or he can, you know, make things go away and whatnot. So just, I put a lot of, you know, it's kind of homage to my mom and I. We watched, you know, Murder, She Wrote. Personally, I think Jessica is a serial killer. 
I, I wouldn't be surprised. She's how can you the, go everywhere and there's a murder? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Are you a fan of the show Bridgerton? I do. I do. Oh, Julie I love it. Shonda too. did a, a fun job with that. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful show. I have friends who are Regency purists, so they're like looking at the costumes and like that and the tiaras and unmarried. Guys, this is not. But a I, you know, I, I, when that show first came out, I, I mean, I knew there was a Queen Charlotte. I knew that. But I can't believe how much research actually did go into that show to make these characters come to life. I just kind of thought it was fantasy but it was it's it's a well done show very well done i hope they make it through the eight books um, <laughs> yeah uh, yeah I, think, I would love to see another season of queen charlotte oh yeah that, that's actually i like that almost more than bridgerton and i think your books would make an excellent tv series i am a very visual person and I picture what characters will look like and things like that. So you did a really good job of bringing everything to life for me. So I appreciate that. I want you to feel like you're there. You do that very well. In, in all of my books, I think I touch on histories that people may not be aware of, people who they've seen a glimmer of. And I do a lot of research so that when I characterize William Wilberforce, you get aspects of his personality in the story. Uh, I want you to feel like you're there, like you're either in the room or you're watching it as these things, you know, progress. So it, it's part of my fun and, and part of my voice and I love it. The next one will be the third murder in Berkeley uh, Square. Berkeley Square or Berkeley Square. What is your time frame? Do you continue just as the other one ends? Do you make it another year? Do you... Berkeley Square is still 1806, but it's the winter. So oh, we're okay. Like almost okay. to the end of 1806. So we're okay. Here. It's winter time. So now you have another. Now is it? Of, it's oh. going to involve the theater. Not this time. This one is actually an homage to, and then there were none. Ooh, Ooh. my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so just and think, dinner party from hell, <laughs> <laughs> and you got everything that you need to know. Okay. Wow. Now, that... where are you from logistically? <laughs> from South Carolina. Uh, I live in Atlanta. Okay. Have you been to London? Yes. Several oh, times. Oh, nice. And uh -huh. if you're in London, take the secret tour of Drury Lane. Um, my daughter and I went. They take you beneath the theater. They take you to the secret passages. So the passages that I'm talking about in are actual passages. So next time I go, I'm going, I love <laughs> London. I said, if I had to move countries, if I could afford it, it's very, <laughs> not yeah, the it cheapest a, place in the world. It's a, it's a bit expensive, expensive. But, but it was, it was very reasonable, the tour, but they literally, my, my daughter's like, mom, please don't ask him if somebody can die like here. Please, please. please, please. <laughs> <laughs> we hear that so much from mystery writers. <laughs> There's a funny story. It's our other woman who podcasts with us. She's a writer. And she asked a guy, or what would be a good way to die underneath his pizza parlor? He thought she meant it. And he was, and then she started to get scared because he was, uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you know Misty Simon? No, no, but oh. that's fascinating. <laughs> so cool. I was like, she was like, I'll never go in that pizza place again. <laughs> I mean, you have to be careful, right? <laughs> you know, like, you, you always think about your audience. If the FBI ever gets a hold of my search feed, it's going to be. <laughs> I think about that too, because I, doing this, we're always researching the writers and uh, and uh, different things about writing. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble one day if anybody of mine turns up missing. <laughs> <laughs> Just the search on your computer. Oh, she looked up poison. How to... <laughs> <laughs> I remember I, I had a bunch of research books come in and they were all about different poisons. And my husband was like, we good, right? <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to the Poison Garden in uh, in London? No, I didn't. I didn't. Oh, I want to go That's there. That's fascinating. So bad. I went there. <laughs> That's in, in 
Kew Gardens, I think it's a whole section that's nothing but poison. We went to Malice Domestic, not last year, but the year before. First year we were there. The poison lady was there, and somebody asked her, what is the most subtle way of killing somebody? And she said, Lily of the Valley. Yes! Yes! <laughs> she said, just put it in a glass of water, and they'll go to sleep and just not wake up. When you said a, a, a murder in 1806, you've got to look at what's available and then what was known of the science to find it. Yes. Some of the things wouldn't catch because there's not real, you know, the autopsies are very limited. There's no fingerprinting. So you, I think they knew strychnine mm -hmm. and cyanide. And those are Just only because of the coloration of the way the skin, they could guess, right? Because there could be a yeah. range of things. Or circumstantial. Mm -hmm. So it's like they saw you near a poison like let's say you were putting out rat poison or something like this to get rid of a problem and now somebody's dead of poisoning well yeah. then boom yeah very circumstantial but there were a lot of true murders in the regency period that you got fodder for yes you could write constantly <laughs> we have a hundred books in this series the old oh. baileys will give you so much delight because it'll give you the court case proceedings and you can actually you know like if you're trying to figure out how to set up a murder and give motives i mean it's a beautiful thing the old bail oh, wow. gives you all the old court cases oh, oh wow i wow. have to check that out yes there's plenty of stalkers too boys and girls plenty of stalkers <laughs> <laughs> psychological fun you could have oh yeah. yeah yeah i read a mystery not too long ago and it was set in london it was modern times she killed the guy in the most unique way he stepped off the curb and looked the wrong way because he was American and he got run over by a bus. <laughs> <laughs> what, she push him or something? No, no. He was just crossing the street. Oh, I thought you said he was murdered. Well, technically he was murdered. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she was with him and then she stepped back, so... Oh, he saw the bus, but he, he looked up. the wrong way because he was American. Yeah, the, the Regency period is interesting. Well, anything historical is interesting because as many crimes as they solved, there were so many that you know, like, went right under the radar. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is why I love this time frame, because they could choose to indict somebody just to get the scandal of the, it may not be the right person, you know, exactly. so it's political. They can ruin you socially for the rest of your life. Exactly. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, there's so many fun layers that you can play with. Yeah. yeah. Well, Vanessa, you just keep writing them because you have two new fans here. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Before you go... Is this the only series that you write? No, it's not. Oh, okay. I got kind of like 25 books. So. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> she writes The Haitian Queen. Yeah. Ooh. So, so I write historical fiction, historical romance, and historical mystery. And it's if I can find somebody's life and I can put the life back together, that's going to be historical fiction. So that's Island Queen. That's Queen of Exiles. That's Sister Mother Warrior. Oh, so, these sound uh, fascinating. I'm going to have to read those too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So if you love history, because it's, I, oh, I, I take yes. you there. I take you to these various places. Queen of Exiles just came out in July and it's a queen we should know. I mean, we talked about Bridgerton earlier. This was Bridgerton before. Uh -huh. you know, it's like, and it's all the actual news clippings. It's so if you're really into wanting to see the weed of things as well as the engagement of the story, as well as the power of this woman becoming queen and then choosing a life of power or or peace in exile, it's it's an amazing wow. story. Oh, yeah, I'll have to. Well, you've intrigued me. I'm gonna have to get those. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. All right, Vanessa, we thank you for talking with us. <laughs> and when you get the next one done, be sure and send it to us so we can give it a review on the program. We'd love it. Love it. Okay. Love it. And you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Trivia. Last week's question was, John Creasy was a prolific crime writer from the 1930s until his death in 1972. How many books did he publish? A. 200 with 10 pen names. B. 400 with 50 pen names. C. 600 with 20 pen names. Or D. 1000 with 80 pen names. The answer is C. 600 with 20 pen names. He became an English author of crime thrillers, published in excess of 600 books under 20 different pseudonyms. He invented famous characters who would appear in a series of novels. Probably the most famous of these is Gideon of Scotland Yard, the basis for the television program Gideon's Way. But others include Department Z, Dr. Palfrey, Inspector Roger West, and The Baron which was also made into a television series. In 1962, Creasy won an Edgar Award for Best Novel from the Mystery Writers of America for Gideon's Fire. This was written under his pen name, J.J. Merrick. And in 1969, he was given the MWA's highest honor the Grand Master's Award. This week's question is, author Isaac Asimov was a prolific author, but he had one serious phobia. What was it? A, fear of the number 13. B, fear of heights. C, Fear of closed spaces, or D, fear of flying. Tune in next week for the answer. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode. We hope you enjoyed listening to our talk with Vanessa. Next week, we will talk with our old friend, Lou Burney. So be sure and tune in then, and be sure and pick up Vanessa's book. You will not be sorry. It is quite the read. We really enjoy bringing these authors to you every week. It is a labor of love, but labors cost money too. Consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com, and it is dark. Stormy BC, and all the information you need is there. And we would appreciate any and all help. You can support us for as little as a dollar a month. We look forward to next week, which is Halloween. So be sure and tune in then. And remember, life would be boring without a little mystery. Bye. Bye.